Okay, so I think we may as well uh, begin. So first, you welcome everybody to uh, what we believe to be the first ESRI uh, webinar. Uh, so obviously, we don't have to go into the, the details of why we're uh, taking this new approach. Uh, but anyway, we're delighted that a, a whole range of people could join us today uh, for, the, for the presentation that will begin in a couple of minutes. So again, as you'll all know, and you, many of you will have seen the, the newspaper reports about this already, uh, obviously, we, we do switch uh, an analysis and have been doing this for many, many years uh, where we look at the distributional uh, impacts of social welfare and tax changes. Um, I guess never before has the, uh, the analysis been as, as important and indeed as stark uh, as you're going to hear today. So in a, in a moment or two, I'm going to call on my colleague Karina Dourley uh, to do a presentation on this analysis of the COVID-related unemployment uh, payments. Uh, Karina, we expect we'll talk for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Um, after that then, we'll try and take maybe about a half an hour uh, for, for questions. So the way we're going to try and work the questions is uh, at the bottom of your screen that you'll see a, a Q&A function. So if people can just type in uh, their questions and I think they will be fed to me and then I'll try and, and moderate uh, the discussion. Uh, and Barra uh, Roundtree will uh, join at that stage, Barra being one of the co-authors of the, the paper. So with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Karina. And as I said, Karina, I look forward to hearing your, your presentation uh, on this important topic. Thanks very much, Alan. So you're all very welcome. Um, today I am going to um, present to you the first in a series of budget perspectives papers this year, which is called the uh, potential costs and distributional effect of COVID-19 related unemployment in Ireland. And hopefully you should all be able to see that on your screens now instead of my face. Um, so here we go. So really, this is a topic that needs very little introduction. But anyway, we know that uh, co the COVID-19 pandemic is causing huge economic disruption. And there have been widespread job losses already. And this is in part due to the public health measures that are necessary to tackle and contain the spread of the virus. So the latest figures from um, unemployment uh, receipts show that about 500,000 extra people are unemployed now directly as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is really huge. So this is about one third of all workers in Ireland today. Um, the unemployment shock isn't distributed uh, evenly across sectors. So sectors which are hardest hit include retail, accommodation and food service um, activities. So the government has very swiftly introduced some new income supports to um, sort of try to help with this unemployment shock. The three that you see in bold here on your screen are the three I'm going to um, talk about because these are the ones that we have modeled and uh, the, these are the three that we're going to show you the impact of. So firstly, the pandemic unemployment payment was introduced and this is a flat rate payment of around 350 euro per week to all those who are made unemployed directly as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. So this flat payment of 350 euro per week is significantly more generous than the maximum personal rate of job seekers benefit. And in some cases, it's also more, uh, more generous than what uh, individuals were earning before they became unemployed. And that's kind of important to keep in mind for the results that you're going to see in a little minute. And fuel allowance was also extended by four weeks um, as a result of the crisis. And the rationale for this was the government was asking people to stay home. So in order, in particular, for older people to do this com comfortably, it was decided to increase fuel allowance uh, for four weeks. And um, the temporary wage subsidy scheme then was introduced and the aim of this scheme is to maintain links between employers and employees. Um, so that in the hope that um, when economic activity picks up again, when public health measures start to be lifted, um, it will be easier for companies to resume their activity if they already have their links maintained with their employees. Um, so the temporary wage subsidy scheme is available to companies that satisfy certain criteria around their expectations to be able to pay salaries and their expected turnover. And it subsidizes up to 70% of the net wage of those uh, who are earning less than 586 euro per week, up to a maximum of 410 euro per week. And for those who earn usually more than 586 euro per week, the subsidy is less. So it's only 350 per week is the same as a pandemic unemployment payment. And there's no subsidy for those who are earning more than 960 euro per week. And um, employers can top up uh, the wages of those employees getting a wage subsidy up to a maximum of their average net pay. And what you can see from this is there are a couple of notches in this scheme. 
and um, they are also quite important in what I'm going to show you. So there will be some workers um, who are laid off and uh, if they avail of the temporary wage subsidy scheme, they will actually end up getting less than they would have if they were uh, actually unemployed and um, claiming the pandemic unemployment payment. So really over the course of a couple of weeks, the government introduced uh, a number of new schemes, some of them very generous uh, to combat this unemployment crisis. And what we try to do in this research is quantify the quarterly cost of the unemployment shock, taking into account here the um, cost of the decline in direct taxes and increase in welfare spending. And we also estimate the effect that the unemployment shock has on family incomes, taking the full interaction of the tax benefit system into account. And to do this, we use Euromod, which is an EU micro simulation model, and we link it to 2017 EU silk data. Um, so to do uh, to, to, to model this unemployment shock, we define three unemployment scenarios, so a low, a medium and a high scenario. And then within each of these unemployment scenarios, we have four policy scenarios, each of which are increasing in support for those affected by the um, pandemic uh, from the last. OK, so in terms of unemployment scenarios, the low scenario assumes that 400,000 people lose their job. The medium scenario assumes that 600,000 lose their job. And the high scenario is 800,000 people. And um, about two weeks ago, or even a week ago, when we were um, coming up with these simulations, and um, this seemed like a very reasonable low, medium, and high scenario. Today, you might think that the low is very low, and the medium is really where we are today. And that's, that's probably true. And it just reflects um, how quickly things are moving at the moment. Um, what's nice about our estimates is that based on these three scenarios, we can see that they, the costs are actually quite scalable. So we were able to come up with something that approximates a cost per 100,000 unemployed individuals. But also, we will probably update this analysis going forward as new data comes in and if this medium scenario doesn't seem to be very um, likely anymore. So what I'm going to present to you today is the result of the medium scenario, so 600,000 people lose their jobs. In each of these scenarios, we concentrate the job losses more in at-risk sectors. So that's retail, accommodation, and food service industries. Then for the policy scenarios, policy, uh, policy scenario A is no policy response. So this is essentially, if the tax benefit system in place was that in place in February 2020, uh, what would this unemployment shock look like in terms of its exchequer impact and in terms of distribution of income? So really, this is just to show um, what the scale of the income losses would be if there had been no targeted policy response by the government. In scenario B, we introduced the pandemic unemployment payment and the extension to fuel allowance. Um, so everyone who was previously unemployed and claiming job seekers benefit is now eligible for the pandemic unemployment payment and claims it as long as it is not less than what they would otherwise receive on job seekers benefit. And um, scenario C is as B, but half of those who are unemployed move to the temporary wage subsidy scheme. So they, um, they, they're moved onto the temporary wage subsidy scheme and their employer pays no top ups. And um, scenario D introduces the employer top ups. So the employer tops up the wages of those on the uh, temporary wage subsidy scheme to the maximum allowable level. Okay, so this table shows you the direct exchequer impact of this medium unemployment scenario uh, for one quarter. So um, if you look at scenario A in the first column, um, you'll see the top figure is the change in market income. And this means that uh, for an unemployment shock of 600,000 distributed, as we have assumed, uh, more heavily towards more at-risk sectors, we can expect a change in total market income of minus 6.4 billion. Now this translates into a net exchequer impact down at the bottom of the table of 4.1 billion and how uh, the composition of this exchequer impact you can kind of see in between. So a large part of it is changes in personal tax revenue. So there's a reduction in income tax revenue of 1.3 billion. And um, there is also a reduction in social security receipts of about 800 million. There's an increase in means tested welfare expenditure of 70 million. And then there's a very large increase in non means tested welfare expenditure of 1.9 billion. And this is basically 600,000 people and taking up job seekers benefit. And if we move from scenario A to scenario B where the pandemic unemployment payment is introduced, and um, the exchequer impact increases. So it increases to 4.9 billion from 4.1 billion. 
And this increase is largely due to the fact that uh, you'll see that the non-means tested welfare expenditure has increased by about a billion between scenarios A and B. So the pandemic unemployment payment is a billion euro more expensive than job seekers benefit in this scenario per quarter. And um, moving to scenario C, where half of those who are unemployed move on to job seeker, uh, move on to the temporary wage subsidy scheme, rather than claiming the pandemic unemployment payment, you see that the exchequer cost decreases slightly, so it's down to 4.8 billion. And that's because some of the individuals who were previously claiming the pandemic unemployment payment of 350 euro per week are now getting less than that through the wage subsidy scheme. And you'll see the cost of the temporary wage subsidy scheme there at 1.1 billion. Moving from scenario C then to scenario D, slightly decreases the exchequer cost again. And this is because the top ups paid by employers uh, to employees are subject to income tax. And also because um, these employees who are receiving top ups um, are less eligible for means tested welfare expenditure. So we see a reduction there in means tested welfare expenditure. Okay, so this table then shows um, how losses can be expected to be distributed um, in different types of families. So um, what's not surprising, what you'll see from this table is that working age families are most affected by um, the unemployment shock compared to retired families. Um, working age families can expect to lose between 14 and 16% of their disposable income in this medium unemployment scenario. Working age loan parents are a little better sheltered um, and so are retirees. And this is mainly because they're less likely to contain a working person. So they're less likely to be affected by this unemployment shock. And they're also more likely to be already receiving social welfare. Moving from scenario A to scenario B, so introducing the pandemic unemployment payment significantly reduces the losses experienced by all family types. So you'll see their working age singles without children, their um, loss goes from an average of 15% to 8.7%, and that's true for the other groups as well. Um, moving from scenario B to C, where we introduce a temporary wage subsidy scheme, slightly increases losses compared to scenario B, because again, not everyone is going to be getting as much as they were under the pandemic unemployment payment, um, as the temporary wage subsidy scheme is a function of their previous earnings. But you'll see that scenario D there is the best case scenario in terms of the um, disposable income losses for, for families. And um, that's because these employer top ups take, play a large role in cushioning the income of families who are um, subject to these unemployment shocks. Okay, so then this figure shows the distribution of losses. So we've um, grouped families here into five equally sized groups ranging from the lowest income to the highest income. What you'll see is in the lowest uh, two income quintiles, so one and two, you'll see that scenario A results in small average disposable income losses of about two to three percent. Moving to the scenarios with more income supports from government and employers and um, basically completely cushions this shock on average or indeed you'll see in quintile one in the pandemic unemployment payment scenario we actually see an average gain of about one to two percent. Um, quintiles three to five um, show a slightly different picture, so they have larger losses on average than quintiles one and two. And these losses aren't quite as well sheltered as quintiles one and two um, by the unemployment supports put in place by the government. So in quintile three, so the middle of the income distribution, um, losses are halved by the income supports in place, and slightly less work is done by these supports in quintiles four and particularly five. Let me conclude quickly before we go to the Q&A. So we have estimated that the sharp rise in unemployment due to the COVID-19 pandemic could cost in the region of 4.5 to 5 billion per quarter in our medium unemployment scenario. And this equates to about 800 million per quarter for every 100,000 unemployed people. Um, a quarter of all families are set to lose some income and the working age families and higher income families will see larger proportionate losses. The policy response to the unemployment shock does lead to smaller family income losses, particularly for low income families, which is quite reassuring as this was undoubtedly one of the um, reasons behind introducing these supports. And the, ta the um, temporary wage subsidy scheme actually adds little to the cost of unemployment supports, as long as it's a substitute for the pandemic unemployment payment, but it may create adverse incentives for low income employees um, to actually seek unemployment especially if their employer is not topping up their wage. 
and this kind of goes against the uh, the main objective of the temporary wage subsidy scheme which is to um, maintain links between employers and employees so that's all Okay, thanks so much uh, for that, Karina. That was really, really clear and uh, very much enjoyed it. Um, so we're going to move on to the, the questions and answer session now. So I said some questions have been coming through already, and I am going to uh, just try and sort of t uh, take the questions and uh, interpret them and provide them back to you. And then uh, maybe between yourself and Barry, you, you can decide who, uh, who's actually going to answer them. But one of the first questions that comes up uh, is the following. Um, on the assumption that this goes on not sort of for say 12 uh, weeks as was initially thought but if you have an extension uh, of the difficulties and maybe an extension of, of the measures uh, people are asking about the the overall cost okay but let me put it like this I assume if everything stays the same the, the, the cost just becomes uh, multiplicate you know what I mean that, that, that you're sort of adding week after week but uh, from what you've described, it seems that if it is the case that as time goes on, uh, companies who may be taking advantage of the wage subsidy scheme basically give up and sort of say they're, they're probably going to go out of business and that you would have people transitioning to the, the PUP payment as you describe it, that actually over time the cost could increase. Is that a correct interpretation? Um, this, the two schemes actually don't uh, call that. So the, the, additional cost of the temporary wage subsidy scheme is very little if the two are substitutes for each other. So they, they don't pay much different to each other. So the cost of the government is reasonably similar for the pandemic unemployment payment and the temporary wage subsidy scheme. So if the temporary wage subsidy scheme, if employers are topping up their employees, then that reduces the cost to the government. But other than that, switching between the two schemes doesn't make that much of a difference because some people are will be eligible for more than 350 per week because their income they might get up to the 410 cap but some people will earn less than 350 per week under that scheme so they're, they're the difference in cost is not that much and um, on the point of scaling the um the estimates you're right so the reason we present this per quarter is because we have no idea how long this is going to go on for so what we present the results per quarter so you can scale them if you want but just keep in mind that the 600,000 so this medium scenario and um, as if the, if this unemployment shock continues for uh, longer than a quarter or if the measures are in place for longer than a quarter, it's quite likely that this number is going to change too. So um, you'd be scaling on a different factor if you like. Okay. And just on that, has the government given any indication, um, I guess the answer is probably not, uh, but if the restrictions go on for longer, has there been any comment around whether or not these payments might be extended? I think it's not out of the question that they would be extended uh, from discussions that we've had. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let me just bring up, it's a, a design feature that somebody is asking about, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the question and see does it make sense. So if you're an employer, okay, and you want to do a top up that's greater than the 30%, does that have an a negative implication uh, for the 70% income uh, subsidy? So are there cases where employers, it might be sort of rather than 30, 70, there's a 50, 50 or whatever like that? Yeah, so on, on that, Alan, um, if an employer does top up an, employee, an eligible employee's pay beyond 100% of the allowable amount, um, then the subsidy is withdrawn against that. And it's un, not entirely clear from revenue guidance, but it looks like it'll be withdrawn one for one. Uh, so okay. that any additional payment would just reduce the subsidy. Um, and one important thing to be aware of, I suppose, in, in, in terms of how the subsidy is designed is that it's based on your average net income in January and February. So you have to be on the payroll uh, before the, the subsidy came to being. And then the amount of subsidy you get is based on 70% of your average net income after income tax, USC and PSRI. So that, that, that's kind of an important thing to bear in mind. But also the subsidy will be then taxable. So I see someone's also asked about uh, arrears and, and possible issues there. So essentially, revenue have said that the amount that's got in terms of the subsidy will be subject to income tax in USC at the end of the year. So if you receive, say, 410 per week and you end up, because of your income earlier in the year or later in the year, being over, having, having taxable income, you will, you will end up having an adjustment made to your tax credits to essentially pay some tax on the portion of the subsidy that, that, that is above the, the credits. So there's going to be an issue, and this is, this is always an issue with whenever people's circumstances change mid-year, that tax arrangements get more complicated. PAYE works wonderfully as long as you're 
if your circumstances are constant through the year, but it can, it, it does create issues when people's circumstances change because ultimately income tax in USC are assessed on an annual basis. So there will be issue for people later on in the year and having to go back and pay more in income tax, but revenue has kind of well tested ways for dealing with that. But it, it is something for people and um, maybe companies to be aware of that, that this okay. will be subject. And actually, you sort of preempted another question there. Um, so you made reference that the wage subsidy is taxable. Is the PUP taxable as well? Yeah, the PUP is subject to income tax, but from what we, from what, what looks like is the case so far, it's not subject to USC like other benefits. So most welfare benefits aren't subject to the universal social charge, but they are subject to income tax if you go above the, the relevant uh, uh, tax credits. Um, so at the moment, it seems like income tax will be uh, subject uh, on the, the PUP uh, and income tax on USC on the temporary wage subsidy, but mm. PRSI to neither. Okay, because the person asking that particular question then is asking a sort of a supplementary around the possibility of a build-up of arrears, uh, as we say now, I presume you haven't quantified it, but it will be another interesting issue then at the, uh, the end of the year or into early 2021. Uh, if people are facing arrears, and presumably that is not the sort of thing we'd want, we'd want to see in the context of uh, efforts to recover. And then there will as well, it's, it's worth saying, Regan, that there will also be some people who end up getting a refund because they paid too much tax in the earlier part of the year. So it goes both ways, but it's probably, given the stage of the tax year that we're at, it's probably more likely to be honest. Okay, so let's talk. Uh, go to a question here, and it's more on the the, the distributional uh, analysis rather than the the logistics of the scheme. So again, I, I'll read it out so I make sure I understand it. So the person asking the question is observing the fact that families with children uh, lose more, and the question is how many of these families with children uh, who are losing are in the higher income quintiles. So is that something you can answer that's, off the top of your head? That's a good question. It's not something I can answer off the top of my head. So they do lose uh, slightly more. So they lose like 16% uh, compared to 14 and a half, 15% in scenario A, and they continue to lose more in the other scenarios as well. Um, I, I would imagine that uh, families with children are more concentrated in the top income quintiles, but I'm not, I don't have a definite answer, maybe Barra? Yeah, so I suppose one thing to say is that the, re the main reason that we get the distributional pattern that we do is because if you're in work, if you're a family that has someone in work, you're going to be relatively high up the income distribution in the first place. Uh, you know, it, 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 uh, and there's going to be some then two income households who are quite high up the income distribution. And if one of them sees an income loss, they're going to see a large reduction in their in their income, but not necessarily be eligible for, uh, you know, lots of other benefits. They will get the pandemic unemployment payment, but that's, you know, for, for, for high earning, for two earner couples where one's on particularly high income and they lose, they're not going to see that much of their income replaced. So they will see a large reduction in disposable income. And so I suppose that's what's really going on there. And that what gives the general pattern that we show is, is essentially that if you if you do have a job, you tend to be higher up in income distribution. So therefore you'll tend to be more affected by uh, a rise in unemployment. Okay, yet another uh, question that has come in, uh, and it's, it's one of these sort of more global questions, and let me try it and run it by you. People seem to be interested in the relative effects of, uh, let's call it the standard um, welfare payment, you know, is it the, the 230, you know, whatever the standard payment was under the job seekers benefit or job seekers assistance. So the effect of that payment versus this uh, augmented COVID payment of the 350. And the question is coming in is, is the COVID payment more positive from a distributional impact? Is it more progressive? Or, you know? so, so yes, it does cushion incomes better than let's say standard job seekers benefits. But with, it, with any payments like this, you also need to take into account the work incentive effect. So the COVID uh, payment is very generous. And there's good reason for that because this is for people who are losing their job and there aren't any other job opportunities around in the short term right now. Um, when economic recovery uh, starts to pick up and people are thinking about returning to work and the economy is open to business, um, then it will be a time to think about whether um, this kind of payment should be maintained or whether uh, we need to reduce this payment in order to give people a financial incentive to go back to work if they can. So there's kind of a tricky balance to be struck there. So yes, in terms of inequality, um, in the short ter term, higher payments like this do reduce inequality. But if they encourage people to stay out of work rather than returning to work, um, they might actually exacerbate it in the long term. Yeah, and just one thing maybe to, to add on that, Alan, is that the 350 per week um, seems much higher relative to the basic rate of job seekers benefit, um, just over 200 euro. 
but it's not as much higher, it's not as proportionally higher as what someone with kids or dependent adults uh, would be entitled to in job seekers benefit. There's always the increases for qualified adults and increases for qualified children that are important to think about. So, you know, the, the pandemic unemployment payment was obviously introduced with a flat rate so that it was easy to administer and quick, and that's, that's an important feature of it. But if this does go on for longer, it may be worth thinking about how do you transition to, to a more targeted system of, of, of benefits, given really the, the big beneficiaries from, from the pandemic unemployment payment relative to the previous system are going to be uh, six single adults without any dependents. And so there is then a question for how do you want, how do you want to phase that and how, how do you transition to that, that new regime if this does end up going on for longer than just a few weeks. Okay, and I may as well ask this question now actually, uh, but you know, in, in the context of a lot of discussion as to whether or not this entire uh, the, the COVID crisis is going to lead to some fundamental changes in social policy, healthcare provision, and, and, and all these. Now, whether it will or whether it won't, I, I think we'll have to see. Uh, but I've heard it argued uh, that this, this is almost like the rapid introduction of a universal basic income um, in this sort of uh, fairly generous flat fee. Um, and I suppose it did raise that sort of interesting question that was, was it the case that this, you know, much higher payment was, was given, uh, accepting the points that you just made, Barra, uh, but that there was almost like an, an implicit recognition that some of the other payments were, from a social policy perspective, perhaps too low, uh, and that as people were being catapulted onto the, the um, unemployment uh, numbers, that, that the higher payment was needed. So you, any reflections as yet uh, as, as to whether or not uh, rather than rolling things back to 220, 230 a week, uh, that it, we might be moving in this direction. As I said, I'll call it like a, a soft universal basic uh, income. Yeah, so I suppose one thing that kind of comes in there is that you've essentially got a trade off with, in, in the longer run, thinking about that universal basic income type system of between targeting and cost. At the moment, we, you know, we, we tend to recognize that there's differential needs across the population when you're out of work or when, when you're in a bit need of social assistance and that that might be because of disability, that might be because of kids, that might be because of dependents and we try to recognize those things in the welfare system. In a lot of the variants of universal basic income that kind of gets left behind in that, that you don't have as targeted measures and so there is a fundamental question there to answer about you know if you are thinking about how this moves in the long run. One is you know is are the payments set at the right level for what we think is the appropriate uh, consumption floor that people should uh, should get but also how much do you want to allow that to vary for different needs um, and then there's there's something there is maybe kind of some wider issues there that this might might lead us to address and wh whether you know the the basic rate of 203 euro or, or job seekers w would be is appropriate for a single adult with no dependents or should it be higher how should we think about housing costs there's going to be big issues in relation to that as lots of people who fall out of work might be eligible now for rent supplement um, and there's going to be issues of how we deal with the transition of ensuring that that that, that people have support, sufficient support for their, their housing costs as they drop out of work and as they move back into work. Okay, so we'll, we'll back off from the sort of the bigger philosophical uh, long-term discussions for a moment to get, get more back into uh, some nuts and bolts. So somebody else is asking um, whether or not the, the net costs that you've been producing for the Exchequer do they include any uh, consideration of VAT and ex excise revenues? I, I guess not, but maybe even qualitatively, do you have a sense of uh, how significant uh, the VAT and excise effects might be? So that's not included in this version. So we haven't, we're only looking at direct taxes and welfare. It is something that we're planning to look at. So possibly the next budget perspective paper will look at this uh, question uh, itself. And I think the QEC produced something uh, uh, where they looked at how reducing expenditure um, in kind of all but the essential categories like food and housing, how that would impact VAT receipts. And that's something we're going to explore a little bit more. I don't know, Barrett, you want to come in on that as well? Yes, yeah, so I suppose that we haven't included the effect on indirect uh, tax revenues through this, so either excise duties or VAT. And I suppose the real, like, there's a real issue there to what extent consumption is temporarily deferred or bounces back uh, and, and, and then recovers when these public health measures are lifted, or to what extent some consumption just isn't going to happen this year or indeed ever again. And that's really going to be important for understanding the impact on, uh, on, on indirect tax receipts. And it's something that we haven't looked at yet, but as Queen says, uh, it's something that we hope to look, to look at in, in future papers in a more sophisticated mm -hmm. way than, than has the kind of aggregate national accounts measures that we've, we've people, colleagues okay. in the tribe looked at today. 
Okay, now yet another interesting question, and it's this. I, I this I kind kind of goes to this interaction between various payment streams. But there's a question around people who became unemployed but are now caring for family members. Um, and I, I guess the, the, the issue here is that you might have had a group of people who might have gone on to carer's allowance or whatever like that, uh, but they're, they're now on, on COVID. Um, so I'm not sure if this is necessarily a, a, a straightforward answer to the question. Uh, the question is really about the, the opportunity cost of people uh, who have become unemployed and now are taking care of, of family members. Uh, but I think that, that that's always rather a tricky one to get a to get a handle on. So maybe I don't know if you have any comment on it, or will we just move on to the next question? Uh, it's not it's not something that we looked at, or okay. particularly for me, I haven't given that one any thought. Okay, so uh, the next one, uh, another really really fascinating question, and um, Karina, I, I bet you're going to say this is your on your to do list. Uh, the issue is, given that retail accommodation and food services uh, are most likely to be the worst effective, uh, affected, is there a gender analysis? And I say that to you, Karina, because I know previously you have done gender analyses uh, of, the, of these sort of measures. So did, did this uh, feature at all? No, we haven't looked at that yet. We absolutely will look at that. Um, so there, there's a bit of international research already looking at how and um, the pandemic is affecting men and women differently and the argument being that women are more likely to be taking up the childcare duties now with creches and schools closed and uh, men are more likely to be continuing as usual either working or working remotely and how this is going to affect um let's say incomes and uh, bargaining power in the short term but also in the long term so it's something we will look at and um, just haven't done it yet yeah I mean, okay yeah, go on, Brian. It's been related to that then, I suppose, in, in terms of if we're looking at the impact of, of what's going on, on in inequality, the real thing that's already standing out is, I suppose, how younger adults seem to be much more disproportionately affected. So the CSO stats out this morning showed that there was a much larger increase in unemployment, if you include the pandemic and emergency payments, amongst younger adults, those between 15 and 24. They look like they've been particularly hard hit um, by, by the crisis. So they're, they're, that's potentially going to exacerbate what were already existing uh, uh, intergenerational issues in, in, in our society. I suppose that's going to be a real important one in the, in, in, in the time ahead is how we address those, if, if particularly if younger adults are more likely to uh, face longer term consequences from a period of unemployment. Okay, very good. Now we have a, a, a couple of questions that uh, are, are, are fairly broad, but they, they, they go to issues really around uh, the financing and the funding of all of these sort of things. So this may, these might be more questions for our, our macro colleagues. Uh, but at the same time, as you were looking at these uh, fairly extraordinary figures uh, coming up on your, on your screens in terms of the exchequer costs, I don't know, did you give some uh, thought to uh, how, how these things are, are going to be funded, especially if this is to, uh, you know, progress for a long time? We did. And um, I mean, there's no, there's no easy answer here. So the, the cost of these measures is very, very high and it will have to be paid for at some point. So the good news is that we can borrow at low rates at the moment, but um, at some point the national debt will have to be brought down and um, either taxes will have to be raised or spending will have to be curtailed in some areas in order to you know, balance the books when uh, economic activity picks up again and they, uh, we're sort of out of this pandemic crisis. Um, we are, we are going to look at this probably later in the year when um, it, at the moment it doesn't seem to make any sense to be looking at revenue raising options because we're just not in that space at the moment. At the moment it's uh, firefighting and then afterwards it's the you know, um, revenue raising options. We will look at that. So, I mean, the hard choices will need to be made in the future um, about how to finance these reports. But I think uh, what we should keep in mind is that uh, we don't know that we can afford not to do this. We don't know what the cost of not, to, not putting in place these measures would be in terms of long-term economic um, outcomes um, um, the long-term economic outlook and inequalities and everything like that. So I, I think what we should keep in mind is that these are necessary measures and um, that we, you know, hopefully we will be in a position later on this year or next year to start looking at how to take them. Okay. We'll, we'll, go on, Barra. No, sorry, apologies. Okay, we'll we'll draw things uh, to a close in in a, a couple of minutes. But just uh, another sort of theme that is emerging: questions around uh, the international comparability uh, of what Ireland has been doing relative to other countries. 
And looking specifically at these sort of welfare measures, do you have a sense of we're on the more generous or the less generous end of the spectrum? So I think it depends on for whom. Uh, so at the moment, the pandemic unemployment payment seems a bit more generous than what our, our colleagues over the uh, over the RC have uh, have have done in re in recent weeks. Uh, they've been more generous, I think, to the self-employed. Self they've introduced a very generous uh, scheme for the self-employed, um, and also their temporary wage subsidy isn't as limited in terms of who's uh, eligible to bring it up. So. The European Commission is actually bringing together nice information and that's hopefully something that we'll maybe be able to see in, in the coming weeks, but there'll be a lot of um, variation across Europe in how countries are responding. But at the moment, it maybe looks like we're being kind of particularly generous towards those on lower incomes uh, and, and, and maybe less so towards uh, the self-employed, although the self-employed will be eligible for the pandemic unemployment payment, which wasn't the case initially, say, in the UK response, which is what generated then the pressure for a much more generous um, uh, um, package for the self-employed there. Okay, and yeah, maybe we'll we'll use this as the the, the final question. Um, somebody is asking. Uh, it, it's really in the context of a, a stimulus package um, as we hopefully begin to emerge from this. And uh, while stimulus packages often are thought about in terms of, and I already you hear you know reference to. Uh, the, the new Green Deal and Green Deals and stuff like that, and that we'll have an infrastructural program uh, that, that will be part of stimulus. But this question is really about whether or not these sort of higher uh, social welfare rates should be embedded in the new systems, kind of back to our earlier discussion on universal basic income. Should the higher payments, in a sense, be, be bedded in uh, and be thought of as part of social welfare, but also thought of as part of a sort of a, you know, a consumption drive or whatever like that in, in the recovery phase? It's certainly something to think about and um, I, I, th I think thought should be given to that when the time comes. I haven't given it any great thought myself at the moment. I don't know, Barra, if you have any... Yeah, I suppose, I mean, we're still ultimately in the longer run mm -hmm. going to face the same issues between and trade-offs between wanting to provide an adequate um, consumption floor, between wanting to ensure that people have an incentive to be in work, and also in terms of cost, there's that fundamental trilemma, which I don't think is going to go away from this. It might be made more acute and, and you know, the, the tension between those ultimately uh, conflicting objectives. You can't do all three of those at the same time of, 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 you know, of limit the cost, be generous to everyone and maintain work incentives. There's, there ultimately is a trade off across those. And I don't see why that's going to change. It, w it will pose real questions, I suppose, on which of those you want to favour. And it might change what ultimately is the political preference for where we want to be on that kind of on that spectrum. Um, but ultimately, I think the same, th those same kind of tensions are going to be there and we might arrive at a different point, but I don't think that's because the, the, the fundamental framework has changed, but more maybe what we think is important has maybe shifted. Very good. Okay, um, I think we'll bring things to a close. We've had a, a good set of questions and everything like that, so hopefully we've managed to uh, tease through the issues. So um, I, I'll do the usual thing where I'll thank uh, Barra and Karina. I'd normally be hearing a round of applause uh, in my ear, so I presume there's handshake or hand claps all over uh, the country congratulating you on, uh, on what you've just done. Uh, so apart from that, uh, just to thank uh, people who tuned in, I've no doubt we'll be doing this again on the assumption that we'll be here um, in lockdown or whatever like that for uh, another little while at least. So I uh, hope it's been of value. And I don't know, Bar uh, Barra Karina, any closing words? Yeah, so maybe just to say as well, thanks to the, our other authors on, on the report. So that was Keelan Byrne, Mark Regan and uh, Dora Tudor, who all uh, did great work in terms of helping to sure that we got this analysis out of the very good. Thanks for that. Okay, so with that, uh, I think we'll uh, sign off, but hopefully we'll talk to you all again very, very soon. Okay, bye-bye.